Hey everybody, welcome back to another Judgment Commentary of Koyomi Monogatari, but today we're going to be checking out episodes 5 and 6, but last time, on the last couple episodes, things continued on with the format that we'd seen in the first two episodes, although they shifted it just enough to make it interesting. It still involved people looking at regular normal things and mistaking them for oddities, but this time it was more akin to pareidolia, seeing faces where there are none. Well, the second one was less pareidolia because there was a face there, but there's probably a similar concept for seeing a different face when there's a face, but I'm not sure what that would be. But it is interesting that both of them chose to involve people seeing faces and stuff. Whereas the other two were people looking at objects and thinking they had more significance or different significance than they really did. Such as in the first one where Mayoi saw what looked to be a demon face in a sandbox, when really it was just that there was a hole in the bottom and the sand was falling downward into the hole, leaving a weird demon face looking shape. And the second one was a story that Suruga told Araragi about her dad looking in the reflection of the bathwater and seeing what he thought was the face of the person he would come to marry in life. But really, they came to the conclusion that he was just seeing his own face and he thought somehow that the face belonged to somebody else. I think Suruga's dad definitely needed glasses. Or the dude is just obsessed with finding his true love, so started seeing her wherever he could, even in his own face. So yeah, they were a pretty good set of episodes, but now we can see how they decide to mix it up with this next episode, which will apparently be featuring Nautico. But unless it decides to circle back a bit, it probably won't be taking place just right after the Nautico snake arc because we've already gone past that chronologically. In fact, technically, as I've been informed, we're already in Nisei territory. Technically, I mean, more so the time frame in between Bake and Nisei, but even still, we're closer to getting into Nisei stuff than I originally thought. But in any case, let us just begin with episode 5. Hmm. Two of the most curious ones we've seen as of yet. The first one broke the mold almost entirely, you know? There was only a very minor amount of, like, misunderstanding something and perceiving it as something else, really. I mean, it was like two seconds where Aragi thought that Kaiki might have had wind-based powers of some kind, when really, it was just clearly figure of speech. That they described it as like it was moving through the wind, you know? It was just spreading from person to person in a way that couldn't really be traced. And then Kaiki starts to give us some information that we already really pretty much knew, <laughs> you know? that he specifically targets those who have anxiety, which is why he picks middle school girls. Right, he said people who lacked a surplus in their hearts. He says he doesn't pick people who are already satisfied, who are fulfilled, because obviously somebody who's not anxious and already feels comfortable where they are isn't going to be as susceptible to his little swindling tricks and charms. And for a second, Araragi thought that, uh, Kaiki might want to target the rich, because he said, don't they usually target rich people, because, you know, you could maybe get more money from that, but... Kaiki believed that the rich would be difficult to deceive because they are fulfilled, but... Most people would tell you that a lot of rich people aren't exactly fulfilled or satisfied. Some are, obviously, but... Given that it's Kaiki here who holds money over all else, stands to reason that he would think those who have a surplus of cash have a surplus of satisfaction in their heart. But just like not all rich people are satisfied, not all middle school girls are going to be dissatisfied. Some of them can feel perfectly content living the way that they are, and they would not necessarily go in for these charms. But I guess Kaiki just thinks he's got better odds. Not to mention that they're also younger, less experienced, so they'd also be easier to trick. But um, I guess I can talk about how we had a nice popcorn celebration party <laughs> between uh, Araragi and Nadako. Does he tend to do this, you know? Celebrate a job well done, taking care of an oddity that was screwing with him? Or is this just a Nadako-only event? 
I'm trying to think back if he ever did anything like this before. Don't think so. I mean, breaking out the multicolored popcorn and just let it pop all over the place? Sounds like a good time. Although the cleanup would suck. And of course, the status quo of the era. Nadako got a little, uh, excited about the idea of just <laughs> getting to be alone with Araragi. But as we know, nothing gonna come of that. And what did episode six have to offer? Well, initially, more status quo. Just Karen messing with Araragi the way that she uh, tends to do, but there was a whole lot of that. Yeah, there was, mm-hmm. Not the first time she's done something like this, but it was uh, quite a bit of it in ratio to this being only a 12 minute episode. But it brought up something more curious than the previous one. It was a tree, a tree that they didn't notice sprouting up around them. Now, you could buy, maybe, that they just didn't notice the tree was growing when it was small. You know, you might just go right past it, you're in the middle of your training, you don't see it. But once it was fully grown, they had no choice but to notice it, but, but you'd think they might have caught it in the mid-stages of its growth at some point. And honestly, it's a pretty creepy looking tree. No leaves, it's got some of that weird like shading with its uh, colors and all that. So, I don't know, I might be a little spooked. <laughs> if suddenly a tree looked exactly like that, like propped up in my backyard, I'd be intimidated. But what was interesting is that at the end of the day, there was no consensus on if it was an oddity or not. They weren't sure, but Karen still wanted to protect it because, well, it's a tree. You don't necessarily just want to cut down a tree for no reason. If it's not really getting in your way and it's just sitting there, no sense in killing it. But in the end, their solution was pretty clever. You know, take things one step further from being spooked up by the tree and just make them respect it. Make them see it as something of reverence, which I can't believe I heard the word reverence. And for a solid like 20 seconds, I thought that it meant the exact opposite of what it actually meant. But it makes sense, you know, you can just uh, spin the tail that the tree is made of the same wood that they used to build the dojo, therefore it is sacred, so we shouldn't cut it down. Maybe you can even make them believe that the tree is some kind of miracle, that it just uh, was born from the dojo itself. And as Aragi pointed out, if it wasn't an oddity before, it might just be now, because we know how oddities work very clearly, that something becomes an oddity when people believe that it is. And if they in the dojo want to believe that that tree is sacred and cut from the same wood as the dojo itself, eventually it'll just become true. Yeah, a few of you were saying that it was going in an interesting direction with these uh, episodes going forward, and you're right, because it has gotten a lot more uh, abstract and cerebral, involving a lot more deeper perspective into the perception of things. Before, it was pretty surface level stuff, things you could easily grasp, like, oh, there's this little wood house thing with a rock in it, so people think it's a shrine. Makes sense. You see some flowers alongside the road, or maybe even on a rooftop, you think, oh, somebody probably died here. It's intrinsic, it's logical. But then we get more niche things, like seeing faces in water or hearing whispers in the wind and believing maybe somebody has wind powers, or having people be spooked by a tree that they didn't notice and trying to make them believe that the tree is sacred so that they don't cut it down. A bit more complicated. Well, I think I've said my piece on this. I wanted to try to say as much as I could uh, about these two episodes because I feel like I didn't say a whole lot during them, and I apologize if I didn't. So I was trying to make up for that with a little bit more discussion, if possible even if 80 to 95% of it is just nonsensical rambling, but that's par for the course. What exactly is episode seven going to be? Naturally, yeah, this. <laughs> Koyomi T, oh, I just barely saw that pop in right before I paused it. T, okay. We go from Koyomi tree to Koyomi T. T is a weird thing. I can imagine there's a lot of stuff they can do with T. I can't wait to see it. Anyway, I think that's about all I gotta say, guys. So for now, that's it. Thank you for watching. Make sure to leave a like and a comment if you enjoyed. Subscribe to be updated on more. That'd be great. Let me know what you thought of these couple episodes as well. Any interesting things that you might have noticed, let me know. That'd be awesome. But yeah, these two did feature 
some more interactions between <laughs> a couple characters in Araragi that we haven't seen in a while, you know? Nadako has been a bit removed ever since her last arc for good reason, and Karen also has not seen too much interaction in a bit, so <laughs> I guess it was uh, nostalgic a bit to get to see them again, <laughs> doing stuff with Araragi. The same kind of stuff that we remember debatably fondly. But yeah, tis all I got for now, so till we meet again, I will see you guys all later!